so we can do that. But everyone, welcome to today's YMCA DFA Changemakers National Project Partner Check-In, and this version being a partner panel. Uh, we're excited for this to be the first intentional touch point between uh, YMCA and the DFA team so that we can start to have a discussion and have some questions answered that the teams who are in the beginning of the research phases, uh, learning, trying to connect with local community partners to hear about the YMCA youth change maker and youth movement initiatives um, across uh, the country and hear some different voices representing uh, the different interests and initiatives and work that is being done so that they can uh, start to uh, continue those conversations and take that back with them and build those relationships. These are part uh, a new portion of the national project experience because this is a year long creating these intentional moments for connection between the DFA teams and the YMCA partners. Uh, so thank you for being with us for this first iteration of this particular program. DFA and YMCA are all about uh, experimentation and piloting and prototyping. And I learned all these great terms from the innovation series yesterday um, of these experiences. So uh, excited for all of you to have this uh, opportunity to connect. We have four YMCA representatives joining today's call who we're gonna ask to introduce themselves in just a moment. Uh, and then from there, we're gonna have a facilitated Q&A discussion and see where it goes so that we can all learn a little bit more and get our questions answered around what does it mean to be a YMCA youth change maker and what is it like to support them at the different communities that we're all um, working inside of and a part, um, uh, a part of. Um, and if anyone in the, as, as we're going, feel free to jump into the chat and respond, ask follow-up questions, we'll be monitoring and making sure that's uh, happening as, as we're going. Um, and I'd now like to, uh, uh, introduce uh, our, our, our panelists. So I'll ask each panelist to unmute themselves and you'll be remained unmuted for the, the starting Q&A. Uh, after your introduction, Kate will start us off with some beginning questions and we'll call on teams as uh, we go to ask some of their questions. We have um, the partner check-in agenda document that holds a lot of questions. So if anyone wants to be in there and kind of see uh, what uh, is coming down the barrel and uh, all the other questions that teams are interested in, feel free to do so ahead of time. But I'll pass it to Heidi. Uh, and for YMCA, for your intros, if you want to just tell us you know, who you are, what you do, where you are uh, and with the YMCA, uh, and then pass it to another YMCA representative on that call, that'd be great. Great, thank you, Ross. So I am Heidi Brasher. I am at YMCA of the USA, uh, formerly out of our Houston YMCA. So uh, great friends with Gloria, who is on this call, you'll hear from. Um, but I have been at YUSA for about two and a half years. My role is in the space of innovation and um, a lot of our grant work as well. So a lot of program connection in there. Um, I have spent 20 plus years of my career in local wise, so can probably still speak to some of that local operations, but um, I'm grateful to be here and partnering with DFA on this national project. And um, I think that was it, Ross. I think I covered it. And no haunted houses with clowns. <laughs> yeah, please answer the haunted houses question as you as you pass off. <laughs> Gloria? Yeah, hi, I'm Gloria Guzman from the YMCA of Greater Houston. Um, I did have the pleasure of working with Heidi for a little while when she was here in Houston. Um, let me see, I serve as the Youth Civic Engagement Director for our association. So I have the pleasure of working with teams that are in our change makers, Youth in Government and Model United Nations programs. Um, and I also help support our achievers and leaders programs with just anything that they might, might come up that they need. Um, and what was the last question? The haunted house? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's gonna be a hard, like a very definite no. I will probably die. <laughs> Thanks, Gloria. Uh, Derek? Uh, good morning, or afternoon, or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> My name is Derek Somerville. I also work uh, along with Heidi at YUSA. I'm actually based out of our DC office. Um, I work on youth engagement and our civic health, civic engagement, all kinds of stuff, getting young people more involved uh, in the change maker work. Um, I've been with the Y since practically college. Um, uh, every, y, every role I've had at the Y, I've had to make <laughs> or build. So in terms of innovation, I, I empathize um, uh, and I encourage you all to keep doing that. Um, just make sure you get um, some pain medicine. <laughs> but uh, um, in terms of haunted houses, um, 
I grew up in Florida, so uh, you know that in itself is a haunted house. Uh, and DC isn't much better these days, but I'm, I'm in, especially if they're like movie themed. But mm. yeah, thanks, Derek. And then Kate. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Gross. Um, I work for the YMCA of the Triangle in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, my role, uh, my title is Senior uh, Director of Association Teen Programs, but really I support teen programs across um, our association, including uh, Youth in Government, Middle School United Nations, our Leaders Club, um, Esports, looking at you Heidi, that's one of our new ones. Um, this past summer I supported a group of interns that went through the DFA process and um, so I'm excited to stay connected to that and to engage more teens. And I've been with the Y uh, going on 10 years, I think. So um, I really enjoy that. And then Haunted Houses, um, if someone else buys the ticket, like I won't go out and be like, I'm gonna buy the ticket and go out to Haunted House. If someone's like, hey, here's a ticket, do you wanna come? I'd be like, okay, sure, so. Yeah, great. Well, all of you, thank you so much for your time and for, for taking uh, the, the energy and focus to answer some of these questions. Uh, DFAers, as we go through today's session, if you are gonna be someone asking a question, just introduce yourself before asking, uh, which would be name, studio, major. Um, and uh, if you want to um, like yes or no haunted houses too, feel free, but we can just jump to the question after those particular you know, intros. Uh, and I'll pass it to Kate to, to kick us off. Awesome, thank you, Ross. And yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Heidi, Kate, Gloria, and Derek for being here. We're really excited to hear your expertise. And thank you teams for submitting such um, thoughtful and interesting questions. I'm really excited to hear how, um, hear the team's responses to these. So just to reiterate the question asking format, I'll be starting this discussion by sharing a few themes that were coming up among all of your group's questions and polling those with our YMCA representatives. And then after a few questions, I'll pass it off to you all teams to share out some of the additional questions that might not have been asked yet that you're curious about. So to start us off, I'm really interested in how you all define change maker and what does change making mean to you? And this question comes from both USC and JHG Micah. We just jumping in, who wants that? <laughs> I can take it if, if we want. Um, we really define uh, change makers in a couple way for the YMCA. Um, first, I think from the basic level, we think about it in terms of uh, who are our young people, right? What are those age groups and how are we defining those buckets? And so we think about our teens, which you've heard uh, several of our folks on the call today uh, work with our teens, really ages 16 to 18. So high school students who participate in, in YMCA programs um, or in our communities. Uh, we then think about our, our college students. So like you DFAers on the call are, are 18 to 22 year olds. Um, many of them are alum from YMCA programs, but again, also the, the general uh, community of college students. And then young professionals. Um, so ages 22 to really 35 for us is that young professional age group. Um, that's a, a group that encompasses so many of our young professionals at the YMCA. Um, I often joke that our biggest, um, and it's not really a joke, but our largest teen program is um, the workforce. Uh, we start to employ youth um, very young, uh, and many of our frontline staff are those young professionals. And so um, we first think about our change makers in kind of those age group buckets, um, but really then think about change makers as those in our communities who are engaged in making um, a difference. Um, and creating communities that we want to live in in the future. So thinking about um, uh, those folks in our communities that are taking action around social issues, who are leading in the space of really um, uh, moving us forward in, in, as a society um, towards the greater good. I don't know, Derek or Kate or uh, Gloria, if you would add anything to that, but from a generalized picture, that's who we think about. I think the only thing that I would add is that um, at least here in Houston, we, when we promote the Change Makers program to students, we tell students that it's for students that are ready to take their passion to the next level, right? Because it's a lot of um, grassroots organizing topics that are important to them around not just social justice, but equity and 
advocating for it. Like, you don't know what's gonna be important to a student. We had a student that fees were really important to him. I didn't understand it, but bees were really important to him. He, everything he wanted to advocate was for saving the bees, right? So um, just really helping them kind of narrow down what's important to them and then helping them create a plan um, to put it into action, right? So teaching them how to use that passion that they have so that they can turn around and, 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 and impact change around that, so. Thank you so much, Heidi and Gloria. Did anyone have, else have anything to add? I think one, one, one thing I'll add on that question is that it's, it's gonna be a trend in all your work is that the answer will not be the same everywhere you are. Um, we don't have, the why is, is the why's greatest asset is that we were everywhere and the why's biggest um, uh, source of, um, I don't wanna call it negative, but the why's biggest um, liability and scaling things is also that we're not, you know, we're all federated, everything's different. So when we say, you know, the, the, word, the word change maker really entered the wise vernacular, how long ago was that? Four years ago, three years ago, Heidi? I forget when the- uh, It's about right. Yeah, yeah um, first entered it. And frankly, and whatever, whenever YUSA or whenever our office says something, then a lot of our local wise try to figure out, okay, what can we do? How does that work in our community? And that that blossoms into things like what's happened in Houston, what happened online, you know, virtually over the summer, what's happening in, you know, and, and, and it, and it kind of transcends all of those different age buckets and different pieces. So- um, while we could tell you what it means, that's part of the, 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 the riddle is that we often unleash those, you know, we, we, we sometimes open those boxes and before we, you know, have, have defined it for ourselves, they start defining it. So that's, that's, I think that's just a riddle to keep in mind. I'm not sort of trying to make it more complicated, but I wanted to put that out there as a, um, a possibility as you all explore the work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all so much. Um, just hearing about the different passions and interest areas of students reminds me of working as a design coach this summer with Kate Gross. Um, and the teams were really passionate about the mental health space. So it's just been really exciting um, as a design coach to, to see um, how excited the change makers are to create action um, and in so many different ways. So that leads me into the next question, which is from both Barnard Columbia and JG Mica. Um, but are there issues or topics that change makers have been historically passionate about? Or is there a topic or direction um, or way of type making impact that they tend to gravitate towards and be most interested in? You feel free to just jump in. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start just by, um, so this summer we had a, uh, in Houston, we have a, a series of summer trips that we do this summer. We stayed in Houston because we couldn't take our teens out, unfortunately. Um, but we had what we called a change makers experience for the for um, two days, and students um, learned about what it what it means to be a change maker. And um, at the end of it, we had a like peaceful walk in our downtown area, where they could create a, a poster just to create awareness. And so I was impressed about. Um, and you kind of touched on it when you talked about mental health, but um, the amount of students that are very passionate about advocating for mental health, right? And so um, that was one of the things that really came up this summer and, and something that um, we use that information to kind of guide, guide some mindfulness um, type of um, workshops for them for this school year so that we are addressing those, those things that they're really passionate about. But that was one of the ones that really came up that I wasn't expecting. I'm gonna drop in the chat um, the topics that the uh, Changemakers Institute, which was the virtual experience we've held nationally over the last two years um, for any young people. Uh, again, one of the things that I wanna be careful of is the word change maker, it will apply that differently. So historically, you know, I can give you the list of all the different programmatic experiences that WISE have done. And then there's the non-program things, more the work-based, position-based things that you could quantify as change makers. So those, it really runs the gambit, right? It's not so much about the issue, it's more of the idea, the idea of how do you, how do you take a young person and make them not just someone who you are uh, offering a service to or a program to, but, but turn around and actually work with them and collaborate them and, and help them do something. Uh, which is tough. If that's the hard part, both for them and for us. Um, it's also difficult because it's not all the same, right? We don't want to, um, 
you know, it, both respecting and honoring what exists and, and what our wives do while also making that transformation is part of the innovation riddle. Um, I'm, what I, the other thing I want to mention about those issues that I put out there is that was really the, really the first time we'd actually kind of asked our students what issues they wanted to talk about, right? We put those issues out there. Uh, only two months later, um, a magazine um, uh, took that and a graphic we'd used and used it to convince the governor of a state to veto funding for the Y because we were supporting critical race theory. Um, if you can see your critical race theory in that list, let me know. Um, but uh, what I will also let you know is that the tension right now amongst young, about what, what young people wanna work on, how, how we engage them in change making and the, the intersection that we're seeing in schools of what can and can't be taught from a civics end. And I don't mean just government, but like, you know, the DEI lens, like we're, you know, they're, they're, we're, we're weaponizing words like equity. So this space is becoming not tougher, but there's a new riddle, a new, a new wrinkle in this um, in this in this work, especially as the why, because the why is partnered with schools all the time, right? We're not we're we're not often the provider of learning. Like sometimes we're after school, before school, but if we're connected in that and and that becomes a part of that discourse, then suddenly the why's are answering those. So um, that's that's something to be aware of. I don't think it's something that I want you to you know get hung up on, but I wanted to to make you aware that that was out there when when, when you talk about issues specifically. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention, the tangential to uh, Lori's point was. We've got a, a Y Core program, which is kind of like a mini year long AmeriCorps or, or NCCC, where they, they go around, they do, they do service in their community, and then do service all over the country. We've done a water rights based one, we do civil rights based ones. We've done, um, we did one around um, uh, Native American rights and, um, and, and land rights. Uh, and those are now in about six states. So it's not all just you know policy, a lot of it is also trying to get them out there in the field too. That went a little bit everywhere, which is kind of the point. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that list as well um, and providing some of the political context on what it means for youth to address these issues um, and start to explore and research them. Um, I'll move on to a question from Team Rice, which is what strengths do you see in your YMCA chapter's current methods of encouraging youth community engagement? And what do you see as potential opportunities for improvement and or growth um, in future, future exploration? Yeah, um, I'm happy to share. I think there's so many great opportunities that our teens are identifying and we're responding to currently um, what they're experiencing. And so when I look at, um, look at the, the way in which we're offering these programs or, or how they're being led, oftentimes it is from an idea of a teen um, or, or a thought that, that they want to see um, kind of develop into action. Um, and then, sorry, what was the last part of your question, Kate? Yeah, absolutely. The last part was, what opportunities do you see for growth or future exploration? Yeah, I think, and this is something I brought up with, um, I think, Kate and Ross before, is just in addition to um, teaching or teens how to see that. It's our developing um, opportunities for our, our full-time director level staff who are not of that teen age or not of that young change maker age um, it, to, to give them the tools to open the door or at least provide them space um, to, to succeed. And so that to me is one of the biggest pieces that I want to um, challenge you all with is, is thinking about how to build capacity for the folks who are leading our change makers to see opportunity. I think one of the biggest riddles for the why, I keep using the word riddle a lot because we're just full of them, but we're the why, uh, but the way that I frame, the why started out as an as a organization founded by a 22, 21 year old in London in an attic with 13 other guys talking as a prayer group, right? They wanted to solve something and they saw a local solution. And for the, for, for the first 20 or so years in the 1800s, it was all 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds gui guiding the movement. But when you grow into a massive organization um, that requires all sorts of you know, governance and leadership, then yeah, you need full-time staff and experts and, and, and institutional knowledge to make that work. But what that has done is where the power center kind of started as a circle around youth, that has drifted in one direction and really in most cases not brought young people along with it. Um, it's become, they become more of the recipient of the service rather than engaged in it. 
So I think that's the biggest opportunity for growth um, is how do we kind of in the, on the same theme that Kate mentioned, how do we get the organization back to in, in terms of trusting um, young people in those spaces? Because it's, yeah, we are one of the nation's largest employers of youth, um, but only 5.6% of our board members are young people. Um, you know, we have why members overall have declined among young people. Young people are looking at membership and, 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 and belonging and understanding a lot differently than they did 20, even 10 years, even five years ago, five months ago, maybe. Um, so that, that I think is, is one of the biggest possibilities um, is, is and, and how do we message that in a movement that is, you know, much like a lot of other institutional movements, very white and male at the top, very diverse and young and everywhere else. Um, and not, not that that's not, neither is a value judgment, but just as a generational divide, how we're making that, how we're, how we're talking about that and messaging that. And I think, yeah, Heidi might be able to put the from to statement uh, in the chat because we've, we've been talking about, there it is, um, uh, that we've used at YUSA uh, to, to guide. We, we just published a, and I, I'll share the link here, we just published a document called Engaging Young People in Governance and Trying to Move the Needle about how we do that. Um, so I'll, I'll share that document as, I think, part of the answer to that question about how, what, where are the opportunities for growth. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both so much for sharing um, a bit more about your experience with that. And I love what you shared in the chat just now, Heidi, kind of summarizing some of the points from both groups that is moving towards young people being active contributors and stakeholders in decision making. Um, and I think that, that that distinction is so important for the concept of change maker as a whole um, and giving, transferring more power to these change makers um, to act on their ideas and research. Um, so I'd love to move into opening up some space for the teams to ask some of their questions as they're, they're the ones that prepared these really insightful um, and thoughtful ideas. So I'd love if you could, if all of the teams could share your team name in the chat and we'll line up in a virtual queue for asking questions. Um, if you are your team lead, feel free to send your team's name. Otherwise, um, I, I budgeted for 13. Yeah, otherwise anyone else feel free to um, just send your team's name in the chat if you'd like to ask your question first. And while this is happening too, I just wanted to uh, say hello to Amanda Trask, who also just joined on the call. She is uh, from the YMCA world. And Amanda, it sounded like there are some other uh, things wrapping up on your end, but if you want to take a, a second to introduce yourself when you have a moment, that would be uh, wonderful so you can join in on the conversation. Oh, and uh, as I'm doing this, Amanda, we just want to say hi. We're glad you're here. I'm just being told you don't have to be on the panel, and we're excited to include you. But feel free to jump in if, if you feel like you'd, you'd like to. But hi, Amanda. Should I should note that one of Amanda's young uh, leaders in her in her, from her association is profiled in that governance document. So. If I'm remembering correctly, I might be talking about the wrong Amanda, but I'm almost positive I am. So teams, feel free to keep sending me um, people or sending me your team name in the queue if you'd like to ask a question. Um, but I'd love to start by calling on team CMU, um, a representative from your team to share one of your great questions. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of our questions was wondering about like why are students typically like discontinue um, YMC programs or so why do they like, choose to leave? Is it because um, there aren't programs that they're interested in or is it more of like accessibility issues? I can start on this one because I think um, it's something we just recently really are like trying to wrap our brain around how to address that problem. Um, but for us, what we've noticed um, when students are, are, you know, not engaging anymore or leaving and they're still of age to be engaged, um, typically it's work related. We serve a large majority of youth that are having to help support their families. And so um, just coming to a club meeting, you know, is taking time away from them being at work or, or making some money to help their families. So um, that's the biggest issue that we see. And then 
Um, so, some of it is accessibility, I, I'll be honest with you, especially right now. Um, it's become very hard to re-engage youth after this really difficult time of the virtual world. And in centers where we don't have enough students to have a full program, um, it's difficult to re-engage them virtually. Um, some of the youth are just tired of the virtual world. So those are some of, I, specific to Houston, I can speak to, you know, one of being financial, they gotta go make money and then um, just being tired of the virtual space. I would echo all of that. I think depending on our communities um, within the triangle, we're finding um, both kids who need to work and other kids who are just engaged in other areas um, outside of the Y. They're finding, you know, I was like many places, sports are huge and they pay a lot of money. And so those kids who were once, you know, engaged in after school activities with us are now really putting their dollars and cents into some really focused programs. Um, not to say that that we can't offer that. I think we just, as a why, and we're equally looking at how do we re-engage that population? How are we offering more programs that are appealing to them? But um, we're seeing very similar things in different, in different ways. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've found over the past year and a half is when I am offering from, so from YUSA's lens, when I'm trying to send resources and opportunities down to folks like Gloria, Kate and their students, I'm sending a lot of outside organizations offering money to those kids. Um, grants, scholarships, cool things. Um, not very many have come from the Y directly. Uh, that's, you know, uh, some locally, but very little others, you know, not. And that's really a, a paradigm shift is, you know, we've, we've been built and, some, and somewhat successfully on um, this idea of, you know, and there's, you always want, I think, I don't, I'm actually not a believer in someone not paying anything for something they're doing. I think you have, having some stake in the game, no matter how small it is, is important to a successful experience because you value it. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things we've realized with, especially with COVID and especially with money is, you know, we've got our youth organizations that are paying young people to do work that we're doing for, whether they do some of the work that we're asking them to pay us for. So if you're a young person and you're like, well, wait a minute, how is this working? Like we need, like, I, I wanna provide them more resources. However, that requires all, in many cases, a very different financial innovation than how the Y models things, right? I'm not just a, not a scholarship approach, but a like a funding mechanism. A, a, like, you know, no, we wanna pay you to be a change maker. And that's kind of a radical concept. Um, but I think you see that not just in young people, but in all work um, in, a, in a lot of spaces. Um, so I think that's, that's one piece of accessibility issue. The other piece is, you know, when the Y was first starting to work with teens, um, they were like, hey, you gotta come to the high schools. And I think uh, so many more of us are thinking we gotta, we gotta get better at working with schools and being in classrooms and understanding that um, and where and how those areas can intersect because that's, you know, right now, especially in a virtual kit, that is one of the few spaces that's either in person or routine. Um, so it becomes, it becomes a balancing act because you wanna make sure that the Y is a part of their equation, but the Y can't go to everywhere. Well, I would just add to that, Derek, I think, um, yes, we need to, you know, the phrase that I think is often used in the teen space that is sometimes over, uh, overdone is, is meet them where they are. Yes. Um, but also they are in our buildings in some cases. And so um, what are we doing in order to engage them there? Um, and, and, you know, we, uh, I constantly pull reports to say, no, we have a significant number of teens that are scanning in and out during specific yeah. times. What are we doing to, to really um, continue their their uh, engagement, just as you're saying, I'm saying engagement often and often, but um, I feel like that's just the biggest piece of, of that puzzle. Of, and, and, of and that dynamic you just saw there, guys, is the idea of, which is one we're all wrestling with, is how do we talk about a member, like a young person? Like, is it someone who swipes in every day? Or are they a member? Is it like, I, we've got, I've got a young person who comes to the Y once a week, um, plays basketball, does this, that kind of thing. Then you've got another kid who has done a program like let's say youth in government for four years has never actually set foot in the Y. How does the Y innovate with both those young people in mind, right? Like how do we how do we strategize around that? To uh, how, do, are we how, we do we push in one direction? Do we push the other direction? And that's that's a riddle that I think a lot of Ys are asking, especially emerging from what we've been through the past year. Thank you all so much. And if you had something else to share, feel free to jump right in and um, interrupt me. But yeah, thank you for that insight. I think that's such a, a wonderful point about looking at 
what audiences and what stakeholders are already showing up at the Y um, and how they might be more effectively um, engaged to be involved with Y programming and feel, um, or how y, y programming might feel most accessible to them. Um, so I'd love to pass it off um, to the next person in the queue, which is Ali from JUG and Micah, um, to share one of their questions. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, this is directed to something that Derek, Derek talked about earlier, which is this interesting intersection um, of DFA trying to offer um, something that these change makers are interested in versus what is allowed um, to be taught in schools. And then you also um, right now talked about how can we better partner with schools? What are some of the other stakeholders that um, you, want, you would want us to look at to ensure that some of the program make that you're interested in offering uh, would, would stick for these youth? Locally, maybe who are you all engaging as stakeholders? And then Derek, you and I can take the national lens. I mean, I think if I'm understanding your question correctly, if I'm not, feel free to tell me, I'm not gonna be offended. Um, but I, right now, I think we're really trying to figure out how to better engage our schools. And I know we already talked about that, but that's where the biggest audience is. They're already there. Like, and, and sometimes I think schools have, um, well, YMCA's as a whole, right? I, I can speak for our organization and our, our association here in Houston and what I've seen. They're really good about having conversations up top with, you know, um, maybe VPs with superintendents, but that doesn't get trickled down. And then um, while we are really strong in after school programming for school age children, you know, little ones um, on site at different schools in the district, it's really hard to get teen programming in the district, right? So I think those conversations need to happen in a more strategic way and all the different parties need to be at the table because that's one of our biggest, I think, our, our, our biggest stakeholder that if we could really grasp how to effectively communicate and work with them, um, the why could, well, we could come in and do what we do really well, right? Um, and the students would already be there. But then also um, engaging with other organizations that are doing similar work, um, maybe not just locally, like for us, you know, we've, we've begun to kind of branch out into like Dallas and San Antonio and groups that are doing some similar work and collaborating, especially right now that we can use the virtual space um, and still be able to connect you to opportunities um, in that way. So if that answered your question, great. If not, let me know, I can try again. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can um, talk a little bit more about some of these uh, stakeholders that are already on the table um, and some that you would want to be in this conversation, maybe in the school context, but in general as well. Um, what are some of these stakeholders that will ensure that these programs that you are planning to offer would be a success? Is it the local government? Is it um, nonprofit organization? Or is it just, in this case, going to be school administration? So I'll tell you that it's really going to depend on what we're working on right at that moment. Um, and it looks different. Out, like what, change, what our Change Makers Club did this past year looks very different from what we're looking at we could potentially do this year. And so um, while last year we were very focused on um, like our active communities work, so doing walk audits in our neighborhoods and noticing disparities that exist between communities, you know, in that sense, we did need some um, engagement from our local government in, to, to be a part of those conversations. Um, on the 23rd, we're actually going to have the opportunity to present some of that information to um, some of our local leaders that will be at an event that the YMCA is hosting. And so our teams will have that opportunity. But I think if they were more open to coming into these spaces that we create like this virtually and sitting down at the table and having those conversations with you, that would be super helpful, yes. Um, I know we tried to engage while we were working on that active communities work with the city of Houston and it was really difficult, right? Um, and I know that they had funding to do some of the similar work that we were doing, but it was really hard to get anybody to, to 
to reach back out and, and actually have some follow through. So it just really, it's gonna depend on the work. Right now, there's an organization in Dallas and the name is slipping me right now, but I can find it and put it in the chat for you um, that we're gonna be working closely with because they're doing some work similar to what we're gonna be doing right now. We're working with the uh, Center for, um, uh, I have to find it for you, but uh, recently with the two school shootings that happened, we're going to be putting together some opportunities there because the youth, the youth expressed that that was important to them. So, um, you know, we've already begun to reach out. And so some of these organizations are really great about, yeah, let's do this. Let's work together. We want to, you know, do what we can to impact the community as a whole in a bigger way. But I think as as you get higher up in the levels, it's a little bit difficult. So I think working with this, with the individual cities directly or the individual districts directly um, is the hardest part. I would just add at the local level, um, you know, working with our our stakeholders, our community partners, or those of um, who are experts in the areas that that our teens are identifying they need support with. So we work with the Poe Health Center to really support our, and that's local to us, but um, mental health um, support is huge. And so in, Gloria mentioned this, but trauma-informed care, um, finding somebody that's not us to, to be experts in those spaces. And so um, that's one area. We're also kind of working with partners on the, in a more, um, in the virtual world, but in curriculum that can help our teens go through their social and emotional learning. We're, we're kind of trying that out and that's a stakeholder to help us figure out um, what we need to add to our programming in order to, to have teens who feel good and strong and um, socially um, yeah, able to operate. Thank you all for sharing. Yeah, what you just mentioned, Kate and Lindsay, we're, we're really interested in trauma-informed care at uh, DFA right now and exploring that space. Um, and just in general, really appreciate how you all are bringing up the, the importance of working with, with outside stakeholders who might already be have existing partnerships with the YMCA and really leveraging those existing partnerships and connections. And for our next question, I'd love to pass it off to uh, Barnard Columbia Studio to ask one of their questions. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Andre and I'm part of the Barnard Columbia uh, studio. Uh, super great to be here with, um, with all of you and thank you just for answering like all those questions. Um, definitely appreciated your insights. Um, I do have a question. So I know um, you all mentioned like, of course, like different programs that the YMCA currently offers. Um, and I was specifically interested, I guess, in the relationship or the potential relationship between the youth and government programs, as well as sort of the more like grassroots, um, like community involved pro programs. I'm curious as to whether or not, or like how separate these programs are from an organizational standpoint and whether or not like there is sort of like a cross section, like do, um, do like folks who are like organizing the programs like work together at all? Um, and like, do you often see like sort of youth like becoming part of like programs on either end of change making? Uh, I'm just curious as to sort of what efforts have been there in order to combine these into a sort of more cohesive toolkit. How long do you have? Yeah, Derek, that's all you. <laughs> well, that's not all me. So I, I would say is this, um, ideally, if you, were ask, if you were asking me, right? So like my experience was I did, I'm in the why because youth and government, I did it in Florida for four years and then went out to college and volunteered and then started, went back and started working in the why there doing the same thing. Um, I think it depends a little bit association to association. Um, using government as a program, much like anything else in the wide, that really depends on where you're at. Um, in some cases, using government is all like we keep we you know using government in or in, in my world, model UN, our service learning programs, any kind of advocacy, all fund f falls under that label. In other places, those are separate things, right? It's using government, it's model UN, it's change makers, it's this, this, and this, and this. Um, so it really depends on who's setting the framing for that and, and what and, and what that community is used to. And sometimes you think government itself can, can is well in historically, I should say, was a state approach, right? So you had a state program and the local wise brought kids to it. Um, but that has that model has shaped and evolved in all on all sorts of ways. Um, so the relationship isn't always the same. Um, you know, and the same can be said for the non, I mean, there, there are other teen programs that are just involved in change making. We have our leaders schools and leaders clubs that are, you know, that are really uh, leaders school, leaders, leaders club evolved as a way to take young people 
bring them in, give them leadership development, kind of personal personal um, uh, workplace and all kinds of training and almost put them on a path to like help lead the Y movement, whether that was in a volunteer capacity or in a staff capacity. And then someone like, like YMC, Y Achievers, Y Scholars, Black Achievers, Latino Achievers, choose a name is all about college readiness and making sure we're preparing young people for college. All of those, I think in my lens and what we're talking about here, I talk about as a change making programs. Um, you know, but there's, there's, you know, there's, there's a silo effect that we talk about a lot in the why, which is, you know, well, this is a youth and government kid, or this is a change makers kid, or this is a this kid. And um, sometimes that's a self-fulfilling prophecy on, on our end as we talk and talk about programs. Other times it's, it's young people and how they filter themselves. Like one of the things, one of the obstacles we're trying to overcome is how local, either whether it's a school or the young people in our programs, their own social situation and network sometimes define who they're reaching and, and what, the, what the, the, the composition of that group of students looks like from Y to Y. Um, and you, know, you all might, you all probably remember from high school, like certain clubs were the province of certain, you know, sections of the school, like, well, those, are, you know, go back, go back to a teen movie and who sits at which lunch table. Um, so I know that that's getting really in the weeds, but bringing it back up for a minute, um, you know, I see it as, as, as interconnected, right? I see youth and government as indispensable to that. Um, it's not, however, um, the only option, right? It's not the, it, it is not in itself change makers. Uh, there is no change makers national program, so to speak, though the change maker label or stuff that a lot of local wise have done, whether it's the Institute or the program in Houston or, or internships or different opportunities that the local wise have created because they, they wanted to embrace the change maker mantle and that has taken all kinds of effect. Some of that has happened within youth and government and other parts have happened tangential or aside or not at all connected to it. Um, so that's my uh, roundabout way of not answering answering. Thank you, Derek. Um, I'd like to pass it off to DFA Rice to share one of their group's questions and get y'all's information. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Mason Laferney with DFA Rice. Um, super nice to meet everyone. And um, I think one of our questions we wanted to ask had to do with, um, we had done some research into YMCA Houston's mission statements um, and how YMCA Houston specifically um, wants to address issues of health disparities and racial inequity and um, other related issues. And um, this could apply like generally to all the YMCAs. Um, but I was just curious, um, how does YMCA Houston and YMCA generally um, encourage youth to engage with those issues and address topics of food insecurity, racial disparity, so on and so forth? And if like there's a lack in that, um, engagement, how can we improve that? All right, so, um, okay, so one of the, I think, more immediate things that YMCA Houston has done, um, and I'll preface this by saying that I, I was gone from YMCA Houston for two years and just came back in January, so I'll tell you from my experience just what I have observed as different, having been gone for two years and coming back, right? Um, we, we now have what we call our Equity Innovation Center. And so I will drop the link in the chat where you can kind of look. I don't know if you saw that when you did your research, but um, we're actually gonna be doing our naming for the Equity Innovation Center on the 23rd. And so the whole focus of that is really to create equity around all of those issues that you were just naming, right? So anything that comes out of that center, we really like try to push it out to our youth as well. It's for anybody in the community who wants to participate and it's free of charge and it's just raising, not just raising awareness, but really teaching people how to um, kind of target those specific issues around the lack of equity, right? Um, so I think those workshops are a great start, but I think some conversations still needs to be had about how we take that, those workshops from just workshops to application. Um, Thank you, Heidi. So, um, but yeah, I think I think when we talk about uh, how we're addressing it, I think that's a great. This is a, a great start, right? Because in the past, I don't believe that those conversations were even happening. And if they were happening, it was with a select group of leaders that were having those conversations. But now it's 
like I work directly for the Equity Innovation Center, right? So I can see the work that's happening and um, how strongly this group is working to create awareness around those issues that are of uh, great importance to not just our youth, but our community as a whole. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yes, thank you, appreciate it. We have a very similar model um, to, to Houston. We are a little bit, I think we're a, a little bit behind you all, but um, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department was recently created and we're moving in the same direction, getting teens involved um, in those spaces as well, so. I'll also mention that we um, have a series of courageous conversations that we host, Mason. Um, and those conversations can be around almost anything. You know, we we did one right around when um, all of the horrible things were happening in the API community. Um, we did one for Hispanic Heritage Month just around like um, immigration and things like that. We're about to do one in November. That's the one we're gonna do um, around gun violence. And so it just it's just a space for teens to be able to have those conversations. Um, normally it's up like panel style and, and teens can come with their questions ready or they can submit their questions ahead of time, which is normally what happens. And a lot of times they don't wanna mute and ask anything, but they do wanna hear. So um, that's another thing that we're doing just to kind of help teens get involved in that space of recognizing um, the issues that are happening and just not that they don't recognize them, but just having a brave space where they can talk about them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I love the title of that, that series, Courageous Conversations. I think it's a really nice framing. Um, to wrap us up, we have time for one more question from DFA teams, if anyone has something there they'd like to ask. And otherwise, as Ross mentioned in the chat, um, we'll share out with the why asynchronously. So we'll make sure your questions get addressed. But would anybody like to take the mic and share a final question? Sure, I can. Hi, I'm Heather from JHU and Micah. Thank you so much for sharing today. This was so insightful and helpful. Um, I guess my last question would just be, what defines success for change makers to you? I feel like we talked about this early on. I'm looking at Heidi and Ross of like how many times that was asked by Ross and Heidi was like, mm-hmm, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question, Heather. I, I'm i just smiling because yes, great question. <laughs> Heather, good to see you again. Um, I think I've begun to really reframe that to say, how can they define their own success, right? It, I think we're past us determining what their success is. Um, and it's that to from, right? The from to movement, right? Um, it used to be about us and our programs and what we were, you know, pushing out or on to change makers, but now we'd love for them to, to define what their own success looks like and, and be a part of um, not only uh, implementing and creation of things, but also um, into, in their future. So for me, it's a, a little bit of a reframe there. I don't know if anyone would agree with me, but that's where I am. <laughs> I'm a little bit on the other side of the pendulum, which is, Shocking. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you know, I really do think that we've got to, you know, there we, the why does some things really well that we haven't innovated within yet. I've, it's that called incremental innovation. How do you forget which framing it was? Um, but the incremental innovation, which is not saying, let's go build something new. It's wait, we've actually got to really, you know, millennials love brick buildings, right? Tear out the inside and turn it into a, a, a something new. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's an old pier in San Francisco that's being gutted and it's turned into a big new paddle boat uh, center, which is really awesome. But that same kind of concept is these, you know, we, we can't dispense with things that have thousands of teens in them. We have to figure out how to evolve within those and make them work. And specifically in a, you know, I've never felt like in a, in a national organization that we truly have some national scope for teens that it feels 
we, 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 so much of our work is local, but that, that national identity for the why sometimes doesn't get there. And that's ultimately a lot of what builds some of that legacy and power in young people's minds. I'm part of that, that bigger thing. Um, without, but the riddle is, how, again, back to riddles, how do you sacrifice, how do you not sacrifice that local innovative, that, that local control, and that local understanding um, that drives what the why does forward, what, no matter where the why is. Um, so that's, for success for me is, I think, uh, um, revitalizing um, and innovating um, kind of our, kind of some, some things we do really well and, and, and using those as a center of gravity to help pull in people who are going to do the cool new things that we don't know about yet, um, and, and using those as, as, as the engine. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate you both bringing your, your unique perspectives on that issue to the table. Um, and in general, thank you so much to everyone from the Y um, for coming today to share your expertise and experience. So, so appreciated. And thank you teams also for preparing such, such thoughtful and great questions. Really appreciated um, the chance to hear from both of you and learn more about this problem space myself. Um, to wrap us up today, I'd like to share out a feedback form for all the members of DFA teams. Um, this is something we're going to be incorporating throughout the YMCA DFA project to make sure that we can design these partner check-ins and other moments to be as helpful as they can for, for all the stakeholders involved. Um, so we'd love to just get your quick feedback. Should take less than five minutes to fill out. Um, but in the meantime, I'll pass it off to Ross and look out for the link in the chat. Thanks, Kate. And again, thank you, Gloria, Heidi, and Kate and Derek for your time and for answering all these questions and for uh, Allison uh, for, for also making an appearance. Uh, DFA teams, the next time we're going to see the YMCA in a call similar to this is going to be in two weeks. Uh, same time on the 28th uh, for the first crit of this project. So that session will be you presenting our work and we'll be having discussions and updates and feedbacks and getting inputs on uh, the direction of all the insights that you're uncovering through your secondary research. Um, in addition, all of the people uh, from the YMCA who presented today are in that partner resource list. Uh, their contact information is there and available for you in that people tab for you to reach out to and coordinate with. I know some people have already started reaching out. Uh, there's many more YMCA people to be added to that list. In addition, all of you uh, should be on the ground working to creating relationships with your local Ys. Uh, to do that and we'll help facilitate uh, that as best as possible, but just keep pinging us and we'll keep pinging around to make sure that you have uh, the contacts that you need to succeed. Um, so I'd like to offer just a big round of applause, this ASL for American Sign Language for applause for our guests, fill up the Zoom screen with some energy. Uh, thank you so much for, for your time and for joining us today. And uh, we uh, wish you the best and enjoy the rest of your day. Happy Thursday, everybody.